office, it's Career Internship and Student Employment Services. We are bringing this presentation to you this evening uh, to talk to you about fish and wildlife management option and what opportunities are available to you uh, as you, or whether you choose to pursue the major or as you graduate with this degree. Uh, we will, uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a few minutes here, um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about our office before we, before we begin. Um, our office is really here to help you. We're help, here to help you figure out what it is that you want to do, uh, what's a good fit for you, what type of career path you want to embark upon. Uh, but we're also here to connect you with employers. Uh, we want to help you gain uh, some perspective as to different people's experiences, uh, what the real world of work is like uh, in the fields that you would like to pursue, uh, and also uh, so that you can uh, just gain some exposure to networking. Talk to some individuals, help you along your career path as far as getting to know individuals who may eventually hire you. Uh, so that's our job. Uh, and we are located down the hall in sub 177 right next door to financial aid. How many of you have been in our office before? Fabulous, I have a couple people. Uh, for those of you who have not been into our office, I would recommend that you just swing by uh, before you leave this evening just so you know where we are. We are here to help you, whether you're a freshman, whether you're a senior, somewhere in between, or an alumni five years down the road who just graduated, or who's graduated. Uh, we're, we're here to help you along that whole path, so please come down and see us. Uh, we uh, will talk a little bit more about some of the things we do, like student employment. If you're interested in finding a job while you're in school, we can help you do that. Internships, you must do an internship before you graduate. You must, you must, you must. It's so important that you have some sort of experience on your resume. There are opportunities to do internships post-graduation. So for those of you that are getting ready to graduate and haven't done that, you can take advantage of those opportunities that might be a year-long or two-year-long experience where you can gain some, ex some exposure to an organization, put something on your resume where you've done some work, gotten into the field. We'll help you with new employment, uh, new graduate employment. How many of you went to the career fair last week? All right, a couple people. Mom on in. Uh, we, our career fair, we have two career fairs a year, large career fairs for all majors. Uh, one in the fall that will be in October, so you should start planning now for our October career fair. Uh, we'll have another one in the spring. Uh, it's really important to pay attention to that cycle because employers are hiring both internships and full-time positions, many of them will have their hiring cycle done by October. Uh, so paying attention to some of that. We have there some in the spring to backfill those, those positions that are still open. Some employers, you know, they're still looking and there's some opportunities that we'll talk about this evening. We do have coaching and advising available to you. If you're just not sure what it is that you'd like to do, you can come in and we'll visit with you. We'll help you with your resume. We'll help you uh, with your interviewing skills. So come on in and we'll visit with you with our coaching and advising. Our career peers do some of that as well, with the mock interviewing, job searching, and resume writing. They're trained to assist you to be the best that you can be in terms of your application materials uh, as you go to apply for those positions. And then of course we have workshops like this one, which are so important. This is our career planning model. We use this model faithfully in our office and we think it's important that you, it's, that you consider it. There's copies in the back, so please feel free to grab one. Uh, because there's some questions on here that are really important. Like the question of who am I? What kind of things are important to me? What are your values? What kind of lifestyle do you want to live? Those questions are really important and should, are typically done during your senior year, but I say you can always come back to this because every time you have an experience, uh, you gain some perspective on what you enjoy, what you don't like. Uh, life happens, things change in your life, so you should always be coming back to this question. It does lead to that second question though, of what's available for me? As you're doing that search, knowing who you are and what it is that you would like to pursue will help you narrow some of these things down. We'll help you figure out what's available, what type of occupation titles are out there. Like our workshop this evening, there's some resources in the back uh, that will give you some uh, example occupation titles uh, for your major. Uh, but also we'll give you a, a perspective of where past graduates have gone the organization as well as their position titles. So it opens up some doors for you as to what's available. And it will help you set some goals, help you decide on where you might want to go. So that in this fourth step here, typically done during your senior year, your final year in school, uh, you're already interviewing for positions, you're negotiating that salary, you're securing the position that's the best fit for you. Okay. All right, so tonight, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists uh, early tonight, we're going to um, 
We have some great panelists, two of whom are on the phone with us and one who's in the room with us. We're glad uh, that all three of them have chosen to join us. Uh, Mr. Matt Withroder is here. He's with the, or on the phone with us. He is down in Wyoming. Uh, he's a game warden with, with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Uh, Linda Cardenas is with us over the phone. She's in Missoula. She's the assistant field manager in the Division for Renewable Resources with the Bureau of Land Management. And then we have Christy Bly here. Um, she's our, our panelist who's in the room, and we're glad you're here, uh, who's a program biologist for the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, so she's going to share a little bit about her work experience. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to them. Um, if you have a hard time hearing, if you can just flag me down, let me know so that we can let our panelists know as well. Um, if you do have questions as we discuss those and get to that point, we'll just ask that you speak up. But I, can, of course, can relay questions as well. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Christy uh, to come up here or have her come up. And I will turn it over to our panelists. Matt, I'm going to go ahead and start with you if you want to uh, do your introduction and tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay. Uh well, my name is Matt Whitroder. I'm a game warden with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, I've been on with, uh, with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department now for about five years. Um, kind of a little bit of my background, I actually grew up in, in Kansas and uh, got my Bachelor's of Science in uh, Wildlife Biology and Fisheries Biology, and then uh, a minor also in Environmental Chemistry. And uh, kind of a a little bit in the day of the life of, uh, of somebody that's in my position, being a game warden, is uh, it changes from day to day. You you never know what you might uh, what your day encompasses. Uh, if you split our split our job up into thirds, I guess it's about a third uh, wildlife biology work. We do all the season settings and work closely with our wildlife biologists, and then the other third is uh, of law enforcement. So you'd be contacting people in the field. Um, and then the other third would be responder public contacts. Uh, this is either talking with landowners, uh, maybe mitigate, mitigating some uh, wildlife damage, um, or just teaching hunter safety class, uh, any interaction with the public. And so our, as you can see, our day changes. Our days change every day. Um, I don't think I've done the same thing twice uh, within, within the same week. Uh, some of the so that's kind of a day in the life of, of us. You're you're kind of always always out there. If you like being outside and, and talking with people, it's a it's a great career path. Um, we interact uh, every day with members of our community, uh, other organizations. Uh, I'm usually always talking with with somebody. Usually somebody's always had a, has a question or a concern or uh, maybe some how they think uh, wildlife should be managed, and so. That's a, that gives us a real good opportunity to get in touch with the members of our community and, and talk to them about stuff. Some of the qualities that we're looking for with, uh, with our employees is uh, kind of a self-motivation, maybe a self-starter, um, somebody that, that uh, would require a little supervision uh, and obviously be able to work as a team. Uh, we, we really strive that throughout our department. And, uh, let me look down the, down the thing here. Um, words of wisdom to, for folks to, that are just getting started is, is uh, especially our field biologists, uh, game wardens, field biologists, fisheries biologists, all of, all of those positions require a, an awful lot of work experience. And, and uh, so I, I would advise for people to, to get involved with work experience uh, in whatever shape or form they can do it in. Um, it's just good to get experience uh, in every every possible field, so I would uh, I really really request that a lot of folks get out and, and uh, as Aaron was saying earlier with internships is get out and get some work experience, see how uh, different agencies uh, handle different things or different uh, companies, um, and it's good to be as diverse as you can. So um, with that, I guess uh, I'll kind of turn it back over to Aaron. But uh, I'll probably be mostly speaking from our actual our game warden perspective as, uh, as for our department. Um, our department hires lots of other lots of other positions: uh, fisheries biologists, habitat biologists, uh, field level biologists, as well as uh, a lot of staff uh, with accounting and, and just day-to-day -day operations of a, of a game and fish department. 
Thanks, Matt. Linda, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. Okay. Um, well, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Erin, for allowing me the opportunity to address the MSU students who are thinking about a career in fisheries and wildlife or natural resources. I'm uh, currently the assistant field manager for the Division of Natural Resources in the BLM Missoula Field Office. We are one of three Western Montana field offices in our district, and the other two are Dillon and Butte, and we're all part of the Montana Dakotas Bureau of Land Management. Um, our field office is relatively small. We have 26 full-time employees, and we're responsible for approximately 165,000 surface acres, and those are mostly higher elevation forested um, terrain. Uh, we do not have any energy development programs in this office, uh, unlike some of our sister offices. Um, and our key programs and resource challenges are forestry and vegetation, threatened and endangered species, including Canada lynx, bull trout, grizzly bear, and gray wolf, and recreation management. Now, you know, for students thinking about careers in wildlife, uh, you know, the, the main difference with the BLM uh, and some of the other federal agencies, when it comes to wildlife, we do not manage populations per se. That, that goes to the state. Those responsibilities uh, for population management lie with the state. Um, such as, you know, Wyoming, where Matt is working. Um, the federal agent land managing agencies focus primarily on habitat management. And we do work very closely together with the state wildlife biologists and our biologists um, focus primarily on providing quality habitat and deconflicting uh, resource uses that may degrade uh, wildlife habitat. Um, I supervise 16 permanent staff covering nine major resource programs, including fisheries, wildlife, special status species, riparian, rangeland and grazing administration, invasive and noxious weeds, forestry, hazardous fuels, soils and hydrology, and geospatial services. In my position, my primary duties are prioritizing and balancing competing demands in personnel management, budget, and policy and planning. I do, on occasion, get to accompany the field staff to observe and evaluate resource conditions and to provide supervisory oversight or guidance to field projects and interdisciplinary planning projects. And uh, much of my time these days is spent in collaboration meetings with other agencies and private organization partners uh, the current planning direction is towards joint agency larger landscape assessments and collaborative treatments to leverage limited financial resources and achieve more effective results on a larger scale. And this is particularly true with forest health projects, uh, especially with the rampant mountain pine beetle infestations and uh, the hazardous fuels buildup. We're currently engaged in a multi-agency integrated restoration strategy project with the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the U.S. Forest Service, Natural Resource Conservation Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, this project is focused right now on collaborative forest health treatments. Um, you know, I, I think one of the reasons um, I, I really wanted to be able to address this group of students is because I, my career path has kind of taken a full 360 degree um, path. And I started out as a volunteering for jobs in Missouri. I got my Bachelor of Science from the University of Missouri, Columbia in Fisheries and Wildlife. And the school worked very closely with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Research Laboratories as well as the state of Missouri um, Fish and Wildlife Department. And so I would encourage students, even if they have to volunteer, to go and get as much experience as they can and meet as many people as they can uh, to get that practical, hands-on experience. Um, the competition for jobs right now kind of reminds me when I graduated in the early 80s. Um, we had PhD biologists washing dishes 
because they could not find a job. Uh, and as, as competitive as it is, I would encourage uh, the students to take whatever experience opportunities that they can get because that will give you that competitive advantage um, when you're looking for those, your first job. The other thing I would recommend as you're building the class list that you're going to take as you're trying to get your degree, um, don't get too narrowly focused in one particular area. Um, as a hiring official, I look for people who have broad, multidisciplinary backgrounds. I noticed Matt mentioned that he has a minor in environmental chemistry. Well, I did the same thing. As much as I enjoyed the fisheries and the wildlife courses, I kind of made myself take uh, aquatic chemistry, limnology, water quality, because at that time, Superfund was really ramping up, and that was where the national priority was, was in cleaning up contaminated sites. And so I credit taking those classes as giving me that competitive advantage that I was able to be selected on a national recruitment effort to work for Lockheed Engineering in support of EPA's National Surface Water Survey back in the 80s. And so you know, I just want to mention that because um, it is attractive. I know when you get interested in one particular subject, you might want to take every single thing you can about that one specialty um, course. But open up your horizons a little bit and try to do some strategic thinking about what, where the trends are going and see if you can provide yourself with some training in those areas because employers, you may want to you may end up working for a private company like I did. I, I thought I was going to work for an agency, but I ended up working for a major corporation. And uh, you can just broaden your horizons that way. The other things that I look for if I'm hiring um, entry-level people is, you know, I'm looking for technical skills, certainly. Um, multidisciplinary background, technical writing, and the ability to do good technical analysis, that's very, very important. Um, if you can take an extra technical writing class, you won't regret that. Um, critical thinking and problem solving skills are also really, really important. And, um, you know, I, when I interview, I, I craft my questions to try to tease out who out there may have those extra critical thinking skills that I'm looking for. And flexibility. Uh, that's very important because our priorities change uh, radically from moment to moment and, and we need people who are able to change gears quickly. So for your people skills, that's equally important to me as any technical skills that you bring to the table. Um, I'm looking for, first and foremost, uh, people who have integrity and a strong work ethic, uh, the willingness and eagerness to learn and ask questions, uh, and that's really important when you first get out of school. It's, it's as important to know what you don't know as it is to master those subjects that, that you do know. Uh, you have to realize uh, what your own limitations are. Uh, and the ability to get along with a diverse group of people under often stressful field conditions and a sense of humor is really important too. So, you know, I kind of hit on some of the things from my perspective that are important um, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions when the time comes. Thanks, Linda. We'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Christy. <coughs> So I'm Christy Blythe, like um, Aaron said, and I am a biologist for the World Wildlife Fund. We have a Northern Great Plains program here, and World Wildlife Fund is international. Um, and so we're one of 19 priority places where um, World Wildlife Fund is working on grassland conservation, and that includes the whole Northern Great Plains ecoregion from Canada, um, in our case, just down to Nebraska. Um, so we cover two provinces and five states, and we have there's some maps in the back with some of our information if you're interested. And so our office does a wide range of things. We do everything from um, imperiled species restoration, like black-footed ferret reintroductions, swift fox reintroductions, um, pronghorn corridor ecology and movements, um, research in sage grouse in relation to energy development, 
Um, we've got a cougar project going on in the um, Little Rockies and Bear Paw Mountains in eastern Montana right now. Um, a whole bunch of species work. Some bison restoration going on, you may have heard about that. And we also do some climate change adaptation. We're working on policy reform. We have a conservation economics program. We're a staff of nine. We cover a lot of ground, um, 279,000 square miles to be exact. So it's a lot. And we've got some priority areas within there. My focus is basically species and primarily small carnivores. Um, like swift foxes and black footed parrots, and um, growing habitat and procuring habitat for both of those. So, my day to day job is um, sadly not the year round field biologist that I used to be, um, but I feel like, in part, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for me to learn some more policy because what I've realized over time is that it's great to be able to bring back species and restore them to the landscape. Like, we just reintroduced black footed parrots into Canada after an 80 year absence. And that's, it's super to be day to day in the field. Um, and of course it's my passion, but if the land underneath the species you're not, you know, that you're trying to save isn't protected, then a lot of work can go to the back side of things. So I spent a lot of time working to keep that habitat intact. And right now we're spending a lot of time looking at where these species distributions are, in relation to future climate change and where, where they could be in the, in the near future at least. Um, so right now I spend a lot of time creating projects, designing projects, um, and collab finding who I want to collaborate with in, in all cases. We work with state agencies, government agencies, tribal, private, and provincial partners. So none of our work is done alone. Um, and it, it's these partnerships that move all of our programs forward because as um, I, I believe it is Linda mentioned, um, the state manages the wildlife, and so we work in concert with them to acquire permits for trapping foxes and trapping cougars and um, collaring pronghorn and all that great stuff. Um, so it's, it's super, and it's a lot of collaboration. Right now, I spend a lot of time um, looking at maps and ground truthing areas and um, talking to partners about how we can move some of these state objectives and, and government objectives forward. For example, you know, how can we recover swift foxes throughout the state of Montana that connects them with the rest of their range? So it's looking beyond just Montana borders to help recover species throughout their entire range. And so it's a super, super job. I do get to escape to the field. And so, you know, my days in the field are, are fantastic and all too short-lived, but um, <laughs> I spend a lot of time mapping prey dog colonies, counting burrowing owls, trapping foxes, helping with cougar work, helping with pronghorn work, um, you know, wherever it's needed. But, but mostly I help other people get going. So right now I've got a swift fox project going on, we're trying to get funding for, so I write a lot of proposals for funding um, to survey the southeast corner of the state, and we're, we're getting a master's student on that, so um, I'll be setting that project up, helping that master's student in the field set camera traps and get her field season going. So it's a lot of um, fun project coordination and also legislation. Um, right now we're working to help some of the species acquire some more wildlife status management. As you probably can tell, prairie dogs aren't the most loved species on the planet, so we're spending a little bit of time trying to get them at least listed as a species that we can manage um, from a wildlife perspective because they provide such great habitat for blackfoot ferrets. So anyway, that's a little bit about what I do. Um, you know, again, I spend a lot of time talking with people on the ground, getting permission to access their lands uh, for trapping, for accessing certain pieces of habitat, seeing if they'd be interested to host fox families or host blackfoot ferrets, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, I spent a lot of time talking with all of our private, um, federal, state, provincial partners um, collaborating on these projects. And so, um, really, the best thing I can offer for you guys in terms of um, what we're looking for in hiring, we do hire some interns. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things, and this is very much a personal preference for me, after being in the field for about 16 years. Um, it's just, a, I just want somebody who's psyched, you know, and somebody who's got some hardcore qualities, which means physical and mental toughness, you know, and just uh, uh, like Matt and Linda mentioned, 
a little bit of a flexibility and adjustability, um, a huge willingness to learn, a huge willingness to not complain, um, and just spend a lot of time in the field under a lot of conditions that you might not be so psyched for, but that knowing that you know an opportunity is here for you to learn, and so just gritting it out. Some, uh, some curiosity about the species you're studying, the area you're in, the landscape you're working on, people that are there, why the species matters, how it relates. So I'm looking for somebody who's engaged and, um, and also somebody who can not only be a workhorse in the field, but actually can take legible notes. You know, now we've got data recorders, so it's not as big of a deal, but, um, you know, I can't read handwriting, then you can't enter the data, it's kind of a pain. Um, somebody who's prompt, I don't want to wake up technicians in the morning to get out in the field. I don't want to be beating people out to the field. Um, which has happened before. And um, again, a lot of these field situations that we have are remote, they're in the middle of nowhere. There's not a big social life. So um, people that are willing not only to live with a bunch of others in small quarters and work all day with them, but also live in the middle of nowhere. Um, the prairie is a whole other world, and it's an amazing one when you get down on that level. Um, anyway, it's helpful sometimes to have ATV certification. Another huge thing we look for in these field positions are um, ex people that have experience driving off-road, four-wheel drive trucks. It's amazing how challenging it can be to drive in gumbo and how few people have experience driving um, stick shifts and four-wheel drive vehicles in gumbo and rain and snow and mud. Um, we can do all that training anyway, but um, and anyway, Again, I'm going to sound like a broken wheel here, but how I got where I am, I spent a lot of time actually in the field of carnivore ecology, doing some really fun wolf and grizzly and bear work, I did some swift locks work and condor work and bark beetles, I fought fire, I volunteered for years, I waitress for years, I was ski bum for years. It took me a long time, a long time to get my first paid job. And there were a lot of times where I worked my butt off and volunteered, and somebody who didn't work half as hard as me got the job. But that's just the way it goes. Connections are what sell you. If you know somebody, if you have a proven record of great work, and somebody can say, hey, that guy worked for me, or that gal worked for me, and she rocked, you have a much better shot at getting in than the person that hasn't made any connections and has a so-so um, reputation. So really get in there, make yourself known, and be, you know, be enthusiastic about it, even if you're not having that much fun. Um, so again, be, be engaged, be present. I have a lot of people that are really checked out, you know, and it's hard to come into a new place and learn so much, but there's so much to learn, there's so much to see, and so I encourage you to ask questions, you know, and be curious about where you are and what you're doing, and really to put your time in. Um, Spend time, get involved with your local chapters, the Wildlife Society, Fishery Society, whatever it might be. Um, again, get as much experience as you can, wherever you can get your foot in the door. Um, and um, really lower your expectations for what you're going to get in return. Because you're going to spend a lot of time putting out a lot of effort, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of time applying for jobs. And sometimes you're not going to get back what you're looking for. And it takes time, so don't give up. You know, hang in there, um, and then work honestly and just work hard. And I think that can't be overstated. And I know it sounds cliche, but it's really true. Um, so yeah, and I guess really at the bottom line, um, it's really important to see each opportunity that you have as a gift and, and live it to its fullest. Because there are days where you're out there. It's 110 degrees, you're miserable, you're starving, you're thirsty, you're burned to crisp, and it stinks, but you know what, those are the epic days that you'll remember for a long time, especially when you're old like me. So, um, you know, integrity and hard work is it's gonna win in the long run. It worked for me, anyway. And so, anyway, I have a quote, which I always try to live by. I'm a runner, so I really like this one. And it says, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up, it knows it must run faster than the fastest line or it will be killed. And of course, every morning a lion wakes up and he knows he must outrun a slowest gazelle or he'll starve to death. And so it doesn't really matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be running. And I guess that's what I feel about wildlife. You know, you got to be on it, you got to be proactive, and you got to be willing to work. That's it. Thank you. So, what questions do you have from our panelists?
What kind of questions do you have and that you're curious about as you're exploring this major, as you're exploring the world of work? Any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So besides being a game warden, it sounds like the other jobs require a master's degree. Is that right? I can take a stab at it and then you guys can answer too. Um, it definitely doesn't, so I started out with that one. Times are changing, you know, it's a lot more competitive now. But I know, at least for the work I'm doing, I'm happy to advance somebody with a bachelor's, um, or even prior to finishing. Internships are huge, and I love giving people opportunities. As long as you can work hard, and you've got some basic common sense, and you know, you're available, um, I'm happy to train, and I don't think you necessarily need it. For, for more permanent jobs, more you know, paid positions, it helps a lot, um, it, at least in my experience, but it's certainly not necessary. I got my first uh, nonprofit organization job with Turner, Endangered Species Fund, with a bachelor's, and a lot of field experience. And so it was my field experience that won me over. Um, so I don't know, what do you guys think? So Linda and Matt, the question is in terms of a uh, master's versus a bachelor's degree, uh, do you, is it more important, pertinent that, that in your organization there's a master's degree requirement or, or can you advance with a bachelor's? And I'll, Matt, I'll turn it over to you first. Okay, yeah, um, for, for some of our positions, I, I believe within our fisheries biologists, uh, they require a master's, but for most of the uh, the wildlife positions, those uh, those require a bachelor's. But something to consider when, when looking at that education, uh, I would, just tentatively, I would think that a, a bachelor's degree with work experience might overweigh a master's degree with no work experience. I think uh, a lot of uh, a lot of our jobs and positions within our agency are experience-based. Um, that being said, we, we do have some positions that require little experience, but for the most part, they, they all require a lot, of, a lot of experience. And with, with regard to promotions from within the department, moving up, uh, moving up to higher positions such as administration, uh, I don't believe any of those requirements, uh, just the, the bare minimum um, requirements to, to receive the position, such as a, such as a bachelor's. Um, would, would get you in the most administration positions if you're wanting to move up the ladder. Um, so I would, I would say uh, both, both, are, both are excellent. Um, I would just make sure you include work experience in with those. Thanks, Matt. How about the Bureau of Land Management, Linda? Okay, um, I would say that you can get into the uh, most positions with a bachelor's degree. Um, I think that's the minimum requirement uh, starting at the grade GS5 level is a bachelor's degree. And the thing with master's degrees, um, we, we're not a research agency. Now, um, the Park Service has a research branch and uh, other sister agencies under Department of Interior have research branches and in those jobs yes, you would probably be expected to have uh, at least a, a master's degree, if not a PhD. Um, they may, the job announcements may not specify that that's uh, like a master's or a PhD is required. And it all depends who else you're competing with for a given job announcement. Um, from my personal perspective, I, I agree with Matt, in many cases, I, if I had two equally qualified people and uh, one of them had a bachelor's degree and a couple of years of really key relevant field experience or experience working with other agencies or the public, I would probably lean towards hiring that person than someone right out of school with a master's and no practical experience and that's, that's strictly speaking as a a selfish supervisor who I would rather have that person with some experience uh, hitting the ground running than somebody with no uh, actual experience that's going to take more of my time or my staff's time, you know, kind of bringing them up to speed. So. Okay. Thank you. What are your other questions? 
Definitely, I have to follow up real quick to that. If you if you are planning to do research, you know, like studying populations, doing population management, or any kind of thing that requires um, statistics and, and more, then definitely have to read masters, and it never hurts to read masters. Thank you. Go ahead. So I was wondering how you stand out as an undergraduate to get the internships. Okay. So Matt and Linda, the question is, um, how does one stand out? So we've talked about some experience and some of that, but as an, as an undergraduate student and they're applying for uh, an internship opportunity with your organization, uh, what can an applicant do to stand out to you? And Matt, I'll turn it over to you first. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, a pretty, pretty experienced uh, experience based I would um, definitely there's a lot of things that people don't include on paper um, such as like a paper excuse me, or a, uh, like an application that are that is stuff that's relevant um, this includes volunteer work uh, different clubs or organizations you're in and a lot of times some people will actually not include all this information and, and when you're just looking at say an application so to speak you don't actually get to see that person uh, and talk to that person. So it's only what you write down. And uh, so I would, I would say to make sure you include everything um, that you you've done that's relevant to the job or to to work experience. Um, other things I would include is is be be proactive um, instead of reactive. Um, you know, maybe make some contacts with these people, uh, hiring agencies to introduce yourself if you happen to be from. Um, that area, you can even go in and, and introduce yourself, make your make uh, your name known with the face, and uh, again, always include references whenever that's available. Um, but uh, more importantly, you want to make sure that you've done quality work uh, for those references. And uh, usually, that that kind of helps us stand out. And then, as far as like actual people that are interviewed, I would I would say. Uh, um, shyness is a tendency that uh, needs to be overcome. You can usually tell when people are shy, um, but uh, just basic prepping for any interview, you want to um, review obviously how your experiences have led you to answer these questions. And I know for ours, ours a lot of it is experience-based, so um, I would just say do as many jobs in the, in the relative fields that you want to get into, but. Uh, I believe it was, as uh, Linda was saying earlier, don't be too specific into into one field, but just get a wide diversity of uh, different organizations or companies that uh, you work for or volunteer for. Thanks, Matt. How about you, Linda? Um, okay. Um, you know, I tell the, my staff when we're doing our performance reviews that effort and attitude are as important to me as actual products and results. Uh, for example, you know, being, being a self-motivated person who is giving their effort 110%, I can, you know, I can tell who's doing that and who's just showing up for work and turning the wheel and, and, and delivering what is asked for, uh, which that, that's perfectly fine because uh, that is that person's job, let's say. But when it comes to standing out, uh, you know, putting a little more effort into whatever it is that you're doing, uh, looking for ways to, you know, really co continuously improve uh, your skills and, and what you're learning. Uh, that self-motivated person, I need those people on my staff. I, I don't need, need people who have to be told what to do and then they finish a project and then they go sit down and wait for someone to come and tell them what else to do. So keep that in mind. If you do have an internship opportunity, don't ever not look busy. <laughs> and ask for things to do. If you've finished all the assignments someone has given you, go back to your coworkers or your supervisor, let them know that you know, you're ready to, to do something else if there's something else that can be done. Um, you know, that, those kinds of things, if you're trying to get something like that on a resume, uh, like Matt mentioned, I do, do pay attention to some of those personal achievement things that people may have done in their, in their past, like, you know, Eagle Scouts or having exceptional grades, making the dean's list, uh, 
volunteering for civic organizations, uh, you know, giving something back to the community, uh, those things, you know, they can be the difference if you have two equally qualified people. Thank you. So uh, I can definitely second that, but there's a couple things. Um, the biggest question I get is, if I have no experience, how do I sell myself? And I, the biggest answer I can give you, or at least the best answer I can give you for that, is tell me where you're hoping to go. You know, what is it you're interested in? Why is it you want to go down that path? You know, or, or maybe you've got a few ideas and you're and you're curious about what path to go. I mean, that's that's a lot of it. Some people graduate with a wildlife degree or fisheries, and they're not exactly sure what aspect. There are a ton of like you can study carnivores, you can study birds, you can study prairie species, and there's a ton. There's a huge range, which is so great about wildlife, I think, because it's like, you know, you get to, like, it's like a box of chocolates. You can take a bite out of little pieces until you find which one you like the best. And I, I don't necessarily disagree with, with um, Linda and Matt about generalizing your experience. That's definitely helpful. But in certain positions, like if you want to go and collar wolves or collar cougars, then it's really helpful to, like, get jobs that lead you down that specific carnivore track. Um, so that's super helpful to mention um, and make those contacts. But also shadowing people. You know, like if you're in school still, you can't afford to volunteer, except on weekends or evenings, call somebody in some agency, whether it's FWP or BLM, Game Fishing Parks, nonprofit, private, whatever it is, tribal, um, international. See if you can be like, hey, are you going out in the field? I need to see what this is like. I'd like to get some access to this, and I need to gain experience. And oh, that's sometimes one of the easiest ways when we aren't hiring to, to help people. So I guess that's my two cents on that. That's great. Thank you. You know, I, I have one other suggestion, if I could just add. Um, students here at the University of Montana uh, have had you know, what, sometimes what they do is they take the approach where they'll actually contact the resource specialist. So I might be the hiring official for these positions, but it's the resource specialist who are out there uh, developing their programs and their projects. And if the students contact them directly, they may be able to work out some type of a volunteer uh, on a specific project or bald eagle nest surveys or, you know, we can always use an extra pair of hands or eyes, you know, doing, you know, some type of field work. And if, you know, don't be afraid to call the organization and ask to speak with the wildlife biologist and develop that one-on-one -on -one relationship with that person because it's that staff person who would approach me and say, hey, look, I found this really good student. They're a uh, real self-starter. Uh, I'd like to be able to use them as a volunteer. And then those volunteer arrangements can oftentimes grow into a seasonal or permanent appointment. Thank you. What other questions do you have? How would an individual who is interested in applying to an internship or a full-time experience with you apply with your organization? Uh, so Matt, I'll turn it over to you first. I'm sorry, Linda, that phone or team Aaron, that phone had cut out. Um, could you repeat the question? Yes, I apologize. How would someone uh, apply, who's, someone who's looking for either an internship, uh, a student temporary position, a full-time position, how do they apply with your organization? Okay, that's excellent. Um, first of all, being a, being a government, government agency, the, the application process is, is now online. We used to accept paper applications, but uh, this being said, I would I would go to our website, which is uh, let me pull it up here real quick, which is um, gf period state spelled out uh, period wy period us. Um, a lot of these jobs are, are announced on our on our website, and that's that's primarily the a good place to start. You can also call uh, our human resources um, people at our at our office. Um, there's a few uh, job search websites that um, do do list government jobs, and those are also a good place to start. So um, I would definitely, if you're particular particularly interested in one agency or one company, obviously um, get into contact with them either on the phone or a personal contact, as well as um, 
just monitor their website and, and speak to the speak to the people that are involved in hiring to see, you know, and, and to maybe even include the future. Uh, what what do you see for um, people retire? What do you see for retirements in your agency? You know, stuff like that because a lot of that changes day to day depending on your your company. You might uh, be able to post more positions seasonally versus uh, you know some that are in the winter or something. So I would have to say our website and then uh, also getting actually in touch with our, our uh, human resources department within our agency. Matt, I'm going to add to that if I can, just as far as your brochures that you sent us. So we have these available in the back. Uh, but so to add to the question then too, can you talk a little bit about requirements in order to apply for your position? So specifically to your agency, I'll refer to the, the game warden exam and that process. And then Linda, when I turn the question over to you, if you can add any specific requirements that students need to be aware of as well. So Matt, do you mind just talking about the exam? Um, yeah, I sure would. Uh, every, every year, um, well usually every year, we'll actually um, offer a game warden exam. This is a competitive exam that's given throughout the, throughout the country. We actually, um, Aaron uh, proctors our exam. And uh, so what we do is we'll, first of all, you need to get online and apply uh, through our agency. Um, and uh, then from that list, we see who's qualified or not for the position. And then what would happen is they would schedule to take this game warden exam. Usually, it's usually done in, I want to say, August and September, but those dates, those dates kind of change on, depending on upcoming retirements. And anyway, with this game warden exam is they actually, you need to score at least a 70 percentile. It's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, it's a pretty intense exam. We usually have a 50 percent pass fail rate. Um, and that's usually just to, we want to see what, see what people know about their critical knowledge within different areas of our, of our expertise. And then from that, then they actually, um, could be invited for a for a in person interview. Um, so with that, as as Aaron mentioned earlier, um, I've included a couple of brochures. One specifically to the wildlife division, which is is uh, what we are. Our department's divided into four divisions: fish, wildlife services, and uh, our fiscal department. So uh, most of our actual field biologists and field level work is done within the wildlife division and the fisheries division. So there's a wildlife brochure back there that details everything about uh, specific jobs within the wildlife division. And additionally, there's also, I uh, included a brochure about uh, personnel, which just kind of goes over our whole, our whole agency as a whole, what we're looking for in employees and stuff. And uh, as, as Aaron was saying earlier, we, we are having game warden exams come up. And uh, if you're interested in taking that exam, uh, go ahead and feel free to, to please put your name and. Uh, contact information as well as an email address on uh, on one of the forms, and uh, we'll be actually getting in touch with you guys um, about the game warden exam, usually by email, sending sending notifications that this is coming up. And uh, for those students that are that are maybe not graduating till May um, of the following year, you know, don't don't be discouraged because this. Uh, this application process actually takes quite some time. I believe uh, from the minute I put my application in to when I actually um, got, we got through to the interviews was about six to seven months. Um, that being said, sometimes it's, it's two or three months. It's just depending on uh, the availability of, of our hiring. So with that, I would encourage everybody that might be interested in this, or at least you would just be receiving more information about that to go ahead and, and uh, put your name down and contact information down on the list. So. Thanks, Matt. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Linda. We're, we just have a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, so all of our seasonal and permanent positions get advertised on usajobs.gov and the student positions can be direct hire. I believe all the federal agencies have direct hire authority for student positions, which means I could non-competitively select a student for a temporary um, appointment while they're in school. And so as students, I highly recommend you guys work on developing those uh, relationships with agency personnel and make yourselves known that you're available because they do have some flexibility in hiring you uh, specifically. Now the USAJobs.gov 
If you are applying for, interested in a seasonal appointment during the summer, just be advised that most of those positions get announced for the BLM in December with a first cutoff date, usually in early January. And a first cutoff date means that you really want to get your application in by that date because the agencies may pull only that list on that date. If, if the offices can't find the qualified people and they want a second list of, of candidates, then they'll pull another list at the second or third cutoff dates. But just, just be advised of that. If you're going to apply, get it in as early as possible, or you may not be considered at all. And then the other thing, um, if you are selected, you will be required to have a background investigation conducted, and you must be successfully passing that without any criminal background um, problems or anything like that. And it's not to say that if you did have um, a minor in possession or something like that on your record, that's not to say that you would not be hired. Um, all I can tell you from my personal experience with young people, make sure that you fully disclose anything like that because it will be discovered even if, say, the police department tells you that, um, you know, you were a minor and no one will ever know about it. it, it the FBI files do come up. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then you can create a My Profile on USA Jobs and create search engines that will go out and look for positions to which you want to apply and send you emails when those positions open up in whatever geographic location you're looking at. And that's very handy for busy people. So it's kind of like having somebody look for a job for you. Uh, I, I think that's basically it. Oh, you might need a health physical also. Some of our positions are arduous and require you to pass um, a physical uh, health exam. Thanks, Linda. We're not nearly that stringent over wildlife fund and some of the benefits of nonprofit work. It's, um, we do have um, a you know, typical uh, application online through www.worldwildlife.org. If you go to our career tab, it'll bring you down to internships and available jobs. And you can go to specific programs like Northern Great Plains or Namibia or something and look for specific jobs there. Um, we often don't advertise volunteer work, so it's always good just to call me or you know, anyone in my office. Um, to reiterate, you can go to TAMU, it's Texas A&M Wildlife Work, right? It's T-A-M-U for, for jobs there. And, it's, um, and then you can also go to Society for Conservation Biology. You can also go to the Wildlife Society for those jobs. I think American Fishery Society has job serves. All these places have great job serves and the serves that can easily find jobs. But again, if you guys want if you want spring and summer internships, start looking in November, December, October. you know, the year before. <laughs> I, I know that we don't advertise to January, February often, um, but it's it's it helps to be the early worm in this game. Thank you. So I, we just have a couple more things to cover before you leave, but um, be before we do that, I'd like to give our uh, panelists a round of applause and just say thank you to them. So thank you. So I'm going to reiterate a couple things they said, but also to give you a couple additional resources. The first one is makingthedifference.org. It's a nonprofit organization that searches internship opportunities federal employment. So it's all based on federal employment, but it's a great thing to look at. So that's one one area to look. How many of you are registered on mycatcareers.com? Okay, so I have two people in the room. I should have about 17 more of you register for mycatcareers.com, okay? It's free, there's instructions in the back, but you must register, okay? Because, and the reason why is we, we post internship opportunities out there for you. We post full-time, student employment. It's all on mycatcareers.com. It's one-stop shopping. But you can use it as an alumni. And again, it's free. It's free to you. But here's the other reason. So I got a call today from the Bureau of Land Management, the High Line Office. So um, Mark is going to be, the hiring authority up there, um, is going to be coming to Bozeman to interview you. Uh, because he has several SEP positions available. And SEP is Student Career Experience Program. There's also STEP, S-T-E-P, which is Student Temporary Employment Program. Look for those types of opportunities if you're interested in working for the federal government. 
uh, because those are temporary positions that they can roll you into a non-competitive opportunity after you graduate. You can return to them every year uh, with the federal government and then ultimately go into a non-competitive opportunity um, after you graduate. It's a great way to get in and gain some experience as well. But the point being that the BLM is going to be on campus to interview for about three, two to three SEP opportunities that he has available coming up and he'll be coming in April. We'll be advertising that position on mycatcareers.com. Okay? You can actually drop your resume to him. You can sign up for an interview once he has some of that scheduled. It will all be out there, so pay attention to that system. Okay? Um, also, I want to just point out in terms of just federal or just employment opportunities, seeking out NGOs, seeking out nonprofit, the federal government. There are opportunities out there, but broaden your scope a little bit in terms of thinking about what you might be able to work for or who you might be able to work for. Um, even policy. Your conference call will end in 10 minutes. I apologize. <laughs> we have 10 minutes left with our two fellows. Um, the opportunities are out there in terms of policy, doing policy research and analysis, being able to write and do some of those things. There's great career opportunities out there, especially if you, as you have field experience and some opportunities or some experience in that arena, especially if you're interested in that. Um, so with that, I'm going to give you some data really briefly. This is information about where MSU graduates are going. So we got a 65% response rate across the institution as a whole, okay? 85.5% of students who graduated last year reported being in employed or in graduate school full-time. We include graduate school, full-time graduate school in this list because in some, uh, some occupations, you do have to have a graduate degree in order to obtain licensure to practice in the field. 7.1% were employed or in graduate school part-time. 5.6 were unemployed but still looking, and 1.8% were unemployed and not looking. Average salary by year and degree. You can see over the last three years that uh, the salaries increased, okay? So the average salary increased. Also by degree level, your average, you can expect your average salary to increase, okay? N, oops, go back. Um, N is the number of individuals who responded to the salary data. We also want to point out with this slide that's really important to note as well. Federal data shows us that the more education you have, so in, in speaking of a bachelor's degree uh, specifically, and then as you go up, you can also expect the likelihood of being unemployed to decrease. Okay, So the likelihood of being unemployed is less. So when people are talking about the unemployment rate in the nation right now, Really, the unemployment rate for those people uh, who don't have a or who have a bachelor's degree or higher is around the seven percent level, which is which is less and between five and seven percent. It's less than the national average. Okay, so just something to keep in mind: your decision to come to school and to obtain your master or your bachelor's degree or higher will pay off for you in the end. Fish and wildlife management specifically, this is the data. Okay, this is average salary across those, those, those degrees. Again, you can see that, um, well, I'd like to say again, you can see that the average salary is increased, but not necessarily in some of that what comes into play with how many people are responding, what they're doing, all that as well. Average salary in state versus out of state. Where are people going? What are they doing? You can see the average salaries here. Uh, again, they increased by degree level. You'll also note though, and we always point out, do the math, because for the most part, with the, a few exceptions in the state of Montana, Bozeman being one of them, the cost of living is higher outside the state of Montana than it is in the state of Montana. So just do the math in terms of looking at these numbers here too. Fish and wildlife management, this is the comparison there. Okay. Uh, location, where are people going? So this is across college. The college or the Department of Ecology, uh, Fish and Wildlife Management's in the uh, Department of Ecology. You're in the College of Letters and Science. 66% state in state, 34% left. Just depends on again on where people are going, and this varies every year by college as well. But 61% of people in, uh, reported to us that they stayed in state. So that's yes, because you're making connections here while you're in school, so you have connections when you get out. <laughs> it's all about the networking. <laughs> Yeah, but, but you know, if you want to stay in state, there's this perception out there that you know you have to leave the state of Montana to get a job. Um, we hope, though, if you're interested in going to Wyoming or going to another location, that you're taking advantage of that opportunity. Um, but you can stay in state if you're interested in that as well. Whatever is the best fit for you, we just like to share that with you. So with that, 
Thank you very much for your time. We we're glad you came. I want to point out again, there's brochures in the back. We have two clipboards floating around. There's one with a yellow piece of paper. We would like your name and information, please. We can keep you in contact with other opportunities. If you want to sign up for the Wyoming Fish um, Game Board and exam information, I have that clipboard. There's handouts in the back, including the salary data and World Wildlife Fund information. Go ahead. And one more plug, um, just because this is so great. Brittany Mosier, right here. Just everyone stand up, look at Brittany. Yeah, Brittany's we'll hiring a in the summer. If you're interested, chat with her. What is she hiring for? I'm studying uh, the impact of the mountain pine beetle outbreak on cavity nesters in the Helena National Forest. So we're going to be hiring two technicians for this summer to catalog vegetation um, information in the Helena so we can compare it to the vegetation we collected prior to the outbreak. So I'll stick around for a while afterwards. Thank you. Um, and then um, my friend Kelly Profit works for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And she um, wanted me to share with you guys our 1515 FWP internships available this summer. Uh, pay range is between 8 12 bucks an hour. The applications are due March 15th, it's coming right up. So um, these are non competitive um, positions for students. So you guys have a good, great foothold here. There's a veterinary disease component, fish component, wildlife one, lots of opportunities. So go to the Montana SWP website for that. And um, I can tell you, only if you get real jobs do you make that much money. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully yeah. you've got other resources. <laughs> we also like to point out mycatcareers.com has several, several student step, step programs at Helena National Forest some different opportunities out there as well. So make sure to sign up for mycatcareers.com. Thank you very much for coming. Have a lovely evening.